Hey, y'all. Uh, welcome to this edition of History and Highballs. We're so glad that you're joining us for this evening's program, History and Highballs, Try on Palace, and Christmas Candlelight. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the museum. So whenever you join us for one of these History and Highballs programs, you and I get to virtually hang out and spend the evening together listening to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so special. Uh, if you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website, ncmuseumofhistory.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. Uh, this is also where you can learn more about joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Our associates and foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps to make programmings like this, programming like this evening's program possible. Uh, we would like to thank all of you who donated funds towards this evening's program. We continue to do our best to keep our programs free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going. And we just continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum and its programming. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program and to please type any questions that you have for a guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, our intern Bobby will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it is my honor to introduce and welcome back this evening's speaker, uh, William J. McCray, Bill McCray. Uh, he was appointed executive director of Tryon Palace in January 2018, leaving his posi position as an associate director of the North Carolina Museum of History and director of regional museums. He joined the Museum of History and staff in 1999. Prior to that, he was head of architecture and restoration for the North Carolina State Historic Sites for 18 years. Bill served as the team leader for the Story of North Carolina exhibit, the museum's permanent exhibit on the history of the state encompassing 20,000 square feet and nearly 1,000 artifacts. Mr. McCray did his undergraduate work at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and received a master's degree from the University of Virginia. He has been a director of a variety of boards and was a founding member of the Museum of, city, of the City of Raleigh, serving as a chairman of the board for eight years. He has published and spoken nationally on a variety of topics. Additionally, he has consulted with more than 25 museums throughout the Southeast on the care and protection of the artifact collection, of their artifact collection. Bill and his wife, Edie, have two grown sons, Brian and his wife, Liz, who live in Raleigh, and Dr. Reed McRae and Emily McRae, who live in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. In his free time, Bill swims for a master's team and enjoys competing in statewide meets. Welcome, Bill. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Stacy. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, are you going to share my screen or do I do that? You can do that or I can do that. It's, it's up to you. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. Um, I had almost 20 wonderful years working with the Museum of History, did a lot of programs and events with the associates. So when Kara asked me if I could do this program, I was really uh, very flattered and, and eager to do it. Oh, Bill, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, you want to hit the from beginning slide so that they can see you full screen. Um, that's what I did. Okay, so it's frozen on our side. I'm sorry. Try it again. Because I'm seeing it full screen. Okay, so it's not coming through on our side. Do you want me to, uh, do you want me to share it? Um, yeah, if that would be the better way to do it, sure. Okay. Here we go. Um, let's do this. While she's, she's doing that, I'm going to thank her for having uh, kind of coached me through some of the technology. Um, technology and I are not always um, friends. <laughs> that goes for all of us, <laughs> honestly. 
<laughs> okay, so Bill, when you're ready for me to advance slide, just say next slide and I'll move it. Oh, terrific. Okay, okay back to the program. Um, what I had hoped to accomplish tonight was to give you a little bit of information about Triumph Palace and its history, talk about its rebuilding in the 1950s, and then end with a very shameless promotion of our candlelight program coming up uh, two Saturdays in December. It's a featured event of Triumph Palace that we're very proud of. So I'm going to begin by asking, you know, why is the palace in New Bern? Well, the backstory on all of that is that in uh, the colonial period, up until the building of Triumph Palace, the government house or capital uh, was wherever the governor was in residence. So it moved around a little bit. Uh, Triumph Palace is the first permanent capital, though other cities served as capital because the governor was there. For example, Governor Dobbs resided at Russellboro in Brunswick Town, which is outside of Wilmington. And he was succeeded by Governor Tryon. So when Tryon was appointed a royal governor by King George III, he was instructed to find a location and to build a permanent capital for the colony of North Carolina. And he was given a budget of 5,000 pounds, which was a considerable amount of money in that time. Um, we'll see as we move further along that uh, Ryan didn't keep to that budget. Um, he had uh, rather uh, lavish plans um, and executed them. And the way he was able to bridge the gap between the allowance from the king and the actual cost was in taxing uh, North Carolinians. And that did not make him very popular and so the term Triumph Palace is really a little bit derogatory, um, kind of poking fun at Governor Tryon for having built such a lavish um, building. Uh, next slide, please. So let, let's get to um, Triumph Palace. Um, Governor Tryon selected New Bern as the location, uh, which I think was a very wise decision on his part. By the 1760s, New Bern was an up and coming and prosperous city. And it has tremendous water access even today with the Trent River and the Neuse River uh, bordering it. So there was access upstream and there was access to um, the Atlantic Ocean. So Governor Tryon has got this assignment. He has selected New Bern as a location. Before he leaves uh, England to come to the colonies, uh, he hires an English trained architect, John Hawks, who comes along with him. Um, Hawks was trained in the most uh, sophisticated uh, design of uh, the time. Um, and I think by looking at this slide, you can see that Triumph Palace is really an English country estate of the 18th century. So while we call it Triumph Palace, Tryon would have called it the government house. And that's certainly how it functioned. Uh, not unlike uh, the governor's uh, residence in Raleigh today. The first floor was business and ceremonial and the family was up on the second floor. So it took about three years to build the palace from 1767 to 1770 and Tryon opened it to the public with a wonderful party in uh, December of 1770. 
At the time it was built, a number of commentators said it was the finest building in all of the colonies. I think you can see that it would certainly deserve close to that ranking, uh, but I bet our friends in Virginia and South Carolina might take some um, exception to that. So how did a building of uh, this magnitude and this sophistication get built uh, in the colony of North Carolina in the 1760s? Well, without a doubt, it involved skilled African-American artisans, both free and enslaved. I don't know of any major buildings of this time period in North Carolina that didn't have the handiwork of skilled African-American tradesmen. But the detailing that John Hawks wanted in the palace was really very sophisticated. So carpenters were brought from Philadelphia to work on the palace. Several of them actually stayed in New Bern after the palace was completed. Now, if you'll remember back in the 18th century, Philadelphia was the largest city in the colonies. And it had a very sophisticated architectural tradition. So it's logical that they would have brought craftsmen um, down. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So the palace is completed in 1770, but Tryon does not stay in North Carolina very long. I don't know if it was a result of having done an excellent job in building a government house, but he was appointed governor of New York, which was a very distinct um, step up for him. And going to New York has a connection to the rebuilding and furnishing of the palace that I'll mention a little bit later on. Following Governor Tryon uh, was Josiah Collins, who lived here with his family from 1771 until he saw the handwriting on the wall in 1775. And he and his family kind of disappeared in the dark of night. Um, I think he, uh, he probably said to people, oh, I'll be right back. Uh, but uh, he left the colonies, returned to England, and I can imagine if I were in his position with a family, um, I might well do the very same thing. So you all know what started happening in 1776. So what became of Triumph Palace during that period? Um, it ultimately would become uh, the capital with Governor um, Caswell uh, in, the, in 1776, but it also served for uh, safety committee meetings and really continued its role as the government house. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here's some of our bread and butter uh, school children visiting um, the palace. But I uh, show this slide to you to give you a sense of scale of how large the palace is. It's a considerable building even by today's standards. So imagine if you will, you're an average North Carolinian um, perhaps living in a house like the Robeson house that's in the story of North Carolina, consisting of no more than two rooms, wood frame, and you come upon an estate like this um, on the river. It, it had to have been a jaw dropper uh, for most of the people that saw it, not ever seeing a building of this scale elsewhere. Um, and it probably infuriated those people who felt like they were heavily taxed to produce it. 
So after the revolution uh, and we become the state of North Carolina, uh, the capital of uh, the palace served as North Carolina's capital for a period of time. And during that time in 1792, George Washington was making his triumphal tour through the South. south. Uh, he came to New Bern. He actually stayed in one of our other properties that I'll show you at the end, uh, the John Wright Stanley House. Um, and he was entertained in the council chamber, which is the largest room in the palace uh, with a magnificent ball. Um, and it is said that he danced with every lady uh, in New Bern that night. So it continued uh, to serve as the state capital until Raleigh was developed um, as the capital in 1792. And then it ceased to be the capital um, when every, everything moved on to Raleigh. Um, it fell into somewhat disrepair, uh, pretty uh, enormous building to care for. Um, things were being stored in it. And unfortunately in 1798, we think either a candle or a lantern tipped over um, in the basement of the Capitol, uh, I mean of Tron Palace and um, set some hay on fire. And the next thing you know, the palace um, is going up in smoke. So the fire destroyed the palace proper, um, as well as doing a lot of damage to the kitchen building, uh, which was later actually pulled down by New Bernians who wanted to salvage some of the brick. But the structure that you see these kids walking into is the stable, and that's the only structure uh, that survived the fire. Um, it's interesting to note that in the early 20th century, it was uh, converted to apartments, but it is the only portion of the palace um, that is original. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So over to the left um, is the kitchen building. Uh, or we call it the kitchen office because there, were, um, there was office space in there for a clerk. It alone is an impressive building for the 18th century, but when you look at it as an entire complex um, in the Palladian style of having a center building, two flanking buildings and a connection with the colonnade, um, it's really uh, a remarkable structure. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm always in awe when I walk through our main gates and, and see this building, having spent a lot of time studying and restoring uh, North Carolina architecture, I'm always impressed at the sheer magnitude and the sophistication um, of the palace. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, I mentioned already that um, the palace burned down, um, but it was rebuilt. And it was rebuilt by three women, principally by three women who are very dedicated to restoring Tryon Palace as North Carolina's first permanent capital. Mrs. Latham, Mrs. Kellenberger, and Mrs. Cannon were among the leaders statewide that came forth to rebuild the palace. And they were aided uh, locally by a number of people, in including Gertrude Carraway, who would ultimately become the first director of Trine Palace. 
If you'll think back to the 1920s or what you know of the 1920s, that was a period where Americans were getting very interested in the colonial past. It's the time period where colonial Williamsburg is restored and developed. And so we were looking to our heritage. So the original planning uh, for Trium Palace really got its start in the 1920s. Um, and then the Great Depression got in the way. And then following that, uh, World War II got in the way. But by 1946, uh, these, this dedicated group of women were hard at it, raising money, working with uh, the legislature, um, and moving forward full steam. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here's a picture of the uh, palace under construction. Uh, there are some people who think the rebuilding of the palace is as interesting or more interesting a story uh, than its building in the 18th century. And I think there's some merit to that. Uh, by the time they started um, building the palace, uh, George Street had already been cut through the property. And will you go to the next slide? There were, if you look in behind the colonnades, you can see that there are residents there. Uh, not only did George Street have to be removed, but all of the housing on the property um, had to either be relocated or demolished to form the grounds that were original to the palace. And what you can't see in this photograph is that directly behind the palace was the bridge over the Trent River. Uh, so these, this dedicated group of women not only rebuilt the palace, got the state to buy the property, move the buildings, but they also got them to demolish a perfectly good bridge and build it elsewhere. Uh, most of us believe that that couldn't possibly happen today, but we're grateful for their efforts. And uh, we've recently celebrated our 60th anniversary of being open. Um, so the palace opened to the public in uh, 1959. If I could have the next slide. Um, and it opened with great fanfare um, in newspapers. Um, these are some images of uh, the articles that were in the Raleigh News and Observer when the palace opened. Um, and we uh, incorporated them into a 60th anniversary um, exhibit. Could I have the next slide? Uh, this is a good example of how interpreters were clothed or costumed in the 1950s versus how we do it today. Uh, the women on the left are dressed in fancy ball gowns, uh, which is not what people would wear around every day. And our interpreter, Sherry, um, is dressed more like um, a person would dress, we'll call it uh, workaday uh, clothing. We have continued the tradition of having tours led by interpreters when the palace first opened, uh, they were called hostesses, and that was considered a real honor to be asked to be a hostess um, of the palace. So we continue the tradition that was started um, in the 1950s of guided tours with costumed interpreters. We could go to the next slide. 
We do a lot of costuming, particularly um, in the holiday season, where we do show what it uh, would have been like for uh, the upper class to have dressed in their finest. Could I have the next slide, please? We have developed a, a new tour called Discovering Triumph Palace. Um, and this particular tour is called Life on the Lesser Stair. Uh, we want to continue to do more to acknowledge uh, the free and enslaved people who made the palace operate. Um, if you think back to the images of how large the palace is, you can imagine it was a bustling operation in the 18th century. We think probably between 25 and 30 people were needed uh, to run the palace. Um, and so we wanted to give people uh, an idea of what it was like if you were a worker um, in Trine Palace in the 18th century. If you would think for a minute about Downton Abbey, completely different time period, but it depicts the kind of activity um, in the basement level um, of all that's going on to run a large house of that sort. And that's exactly what would have been going on in Triumph Palace in the 18th century. I wish we had 25 or 30 people that we could, um, used to give that sense of activity in the building, but uh, we don't. So we are uh, developing new tours uh, for a number of reasons, to give people more options, uh, to explore subjects that we can't cover during the regular tour, uh, and to offer something new to Newburnians who may have been to the palace multiple times. Um, may I have the next slide? We do a lot of work in the kitchen, both with open hearth cooking, as well as talking about the kitchen as the apothecary and the place where medicines in the 18th century uh, framework of it, uh, were dis, uh, dispensed. Um, this is a great way with a display like this and visitors coming by, by where you can engage them in things that they know about and things that they don't know about in terms of um, the healing arts. Can I have the next slide? put this one in here, not because of the beautiful Christmas decorations, which of course are not really 18th century. They are very much colonial revival. Um, but I wanted to show you the magnificent stair in the palace. It is all mahogany, um, hand carved, and it is cantilevered so that one stair uh, supports the next one. This one feature of the palace costs nearly half of the entire budget for the palace. Um, so glad we have it. Uh, so glad John Hawkes designed it. Uh, but it is uh, a very costly uh, feature. Could I have the next slide? Um, give you an example of the furnished rooms in the palace, should you come to tour, and I certainly hope you will. I've only given you a very small taste of the broader history of Triumph Palace and New Bern. I'm not a trained uh, tour guide, so um, the, the section of the slide to the lower right uh, depicts Governor Tryon's bedroom and the clothing he would have worn day to day. Could I have the next slide, please? 
This is one of my favorite rooms in the palace. It's in the center on the second uh, floor. It's called the alcove bedchamber, and you can see for good reason why it's called that. Uh, what I like about this and find so amusing is that John Hawkes obviously hadn't spent a lot of summers in North Carolina when he designed this space. Um, imagine being in an enclosed area like that um, in July in North Carolina. Uh, this was not a very popular uh, bedroom uh, because it was just uh, so uncomfortable, but it certainly looks beautiful and gives us an opportunity to talk about how rooms could be laid out. And you'll see the open door is actually a closet, uh, which is a pretty rare commodity in the 18th century. I could have the next slide. We have a number of interpretive groups at Triumph Palace. Um, depicted here is our Jean Canu True. Jean Canu was an African American tradition only in a few areas of the South, but uh, was uh, practiced in New Bern. It was a celebration the day after Christmas where plantation owners would allow the enslaved population a day to celebrate play music, dance, bring back traditions that had persisted um, from Africa. So we um, take the Jean Canu troupe out to schools and to events to help talk about um, continuity of uh, traditions within the African-American enslaved community. If I could have the next slide. The interpretive group that we have is the 35th United States Colored Troops. Uh, New Bern was occupied very early, uh, six, uh, 1863 by Union forces and became a kind of Mecca or hub for um, enslaved people uh, to gather, um, certainly trying to uh, obtain their freedom. Uh, and when they came under federal control, uh, for all intents and purposes, were freed. Many of the men wanted to fight for the Union side, um, and a number of colored troops across all of the United States um, were formed. Uh, if you've seen or heard of the movie Glory, it's about the Massachusetts uh, 54th, uh, which was a um, colored troops. So we know that the 35th was formed at the New Bern Academy, which is one of our properties. And we have created an interpretive group and have an amazing array of, of men who have learned the history of the men who served in the 35th. But what is particularly interesting is a number of the men who are in our reenactment group are descendants of men who served in the 35th. If I could have the next slide. I love our uh, young drummer boy. Um, and there's nothing like the sound of drums to get uh, people uh, animated. Could I have the next slide? And speaking of drums, we also have a fife and drum corps. Um, if you come to Candlelight, uh, they lead the procession in. Um, 
We've got more drummers than we do fifers. So if any of you know somebody who would be a good candidate to be one of our fifers, we'd love to have them join us. Uh, we're getting excited about the United States 250th anniversary where we can feature not only our fife and drum corps, uh, but we have another interpretive group, uh, the Continental Line. So we've got gonna have an awful lot to offer for the US 250th. I could have the next slide. So now we get to my uh, shameless promotion. Um, December 11th, Saturday, December 18th, a Saturday, um, is our candlelight program. It begins at 4.30. Uh, tickets are timed, although the majority of the activities will be out on the grounds. Um, the palace is decorated um, inside and out, and we will be offering time tours um, of the palace proper. Could I have the next slide? And this is what you might expect um, should you come down, and I hope you will. It's a very easy drive from Raleigh to New Bern. Um, in addition to the tours, you would go to the next slide. Oh, I got jumped ahead of myself. Um, this is the John Wright Stanley House, which I mentioned to you earlier. This is where uh, George Washington stayed when he came to uh, New Bern in 1792. Uh, what will, we will be offering this year is a walkthrough um, of this very important 18th century house. And if I could have the next slide. as well as the Dixon House, which dates uh, to the 1830s, gives you a feeling for prosperous people's home during that time period. So if we could go to the next slide. In addition to the tours and to an area where uh, beer and wine can be purchased and an area where hot cocoa uh, and snacks can be purchased. Uh, we have a tent where we will have entertainers, including sword swallower, jugglers, and here um, a fire eater. I've seen this done at several candlelights and I can't quite figure out how they do it, but they must be successful because they continue to come back uh, year after year. I'll have my two and a half year old granddaughter here for the first day of candlelight, and I'm going to be curious as to her reaction to the entertainment. Uh, if I could have the next slide. Our Jean Canu troupe performs several times um, in the evening right outside uh, the palace gates so that you get a sense of what that ceremony was like um, and what the music was like, what the dancing was like uh, for enslaved people who were given a little bit of latitude on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. If I could have the next slide. Normally we have dancing in the council chamber uh, because of COVID and vaccine requirements. We are a little down on uh, the number of dancers. So we will be depicting uh, this space as if a dance has just concluded. We'll have harpsichord music um, and people dress similar to the way you see them here. I could have the next slide. This is what the palace looks like for um, candlelight. While it is not an accurate facsimile of uh, lighting in the 18th century, it definitely gives you a sense that um, evening events were 
much lower light than we are used to today. The palace looks absolutely beautiful with the candles in the window. Um, they are electric candles, so we're not going to uh, create a second fire. Um, and then we have candles in holders all across the grounds. If I could have the next slide, which is the last slide. Um, our candlelight program begins at 4.30 and it ends at 9.30 with a black powder display of fireworks that are absolutely spectacular. Uh, my wife's not a big fireworks fan and she keeps saying, oh, I can't wait to see them again this year. They are amazing. So I hope that you will consider coming to Tryon Palace either for a regular tour. Uh, we offer tours of the decorations called decor tours several times in uh, November and December. Uh, then candlelight is two days um, in December, the 11th um, and the 18th. I think regardless of when you come, uh, you'll have a wonderful experience at the palace and you'll find that New Bern is a great place to visit. Lots of wonderful restaurants and shops in a very vibrant downtown. So I hope I might see some of you um, at Candlelight and I'll be happy to do my best to answer some questions. Hi, uh, yeah, I can, uh, I will be asking the questions. Uh, okay. So we'll just go in order. What purpose uh, did the building serve from 1800 until 1920? Which, bill? the palace was destroyed or burned in 1798. So the palace was not there during that time period. After the palace burned, George Street was cut through to the water and lots were sold. Uh, is the, we have two questions about the staircase, actually. Was yeah. it expensive when it was originally built in the 18th century? And is it based on an original design or is it a totally new design? Uh, no, um, it is uh, based on the original drawings by John Hawkes, which survived in the British Museum. And I should have said that at the beginning, the palace is a very accurate reconstruction because we had the original drawings. So it is based on uh, Hawks's drawings and yes, it was phenomenally expensive. Uh, are the floors made of pine is a question. They are, they're heart pine except for the entry hall, which um, is marble. And we know that to be the case, not only from the drawings, but also from archeology span that was done in the 1950s and, and found uh, the fragments of marble. Next question already answered. Uh, do you provide the clothes to the Pfeiffer and Drummer Corps? We uh, do. do provide we, provide, the clothing? we provide all of the, uh, we refer to them as costumes, but uh, we provide all of the clothing for our interpretive groups and all their accessories. Um, and all of our interpreters uh, get dressed by um, our costumer um, and if things rip, she mends them. And uh, so, yes, we, we provide all of that. And we're able to do that because we have uh, the Tryon Palace Foundation, very similar to the Associates and the Museum of History Foundation um, that provides uh, very generous support to us. You may have frozen up a little. 
Yeah, I think maybe he has. So I'm going to, I'm going to continue on. Um, okay. Can, can you read them? Yes. So our okay. next question is from Linda and she says, was the government actually conducted, was government actually conducted in Toronto Palace? Or was there a separate legislative Pro, building? Does it seem to be having a suboptimal connection? That's yeah, okay. Stacy's Stacey, jumped in. Um, so, so the question um, was, was uh, the government actually functioning in Tryon Palace? And the answer is yes. Uh, the council chamber, which is the largest room and was where the costume people dancing was located. That's where the governor uh, would meet with his senior advisors. I'm sure there were a lot, there was a lot of coming and going um, in that building. So it was a very active Capitol building. Awesome. Um, our next question is from Barrett and they ask, is the palace wheelchair accessible? Um, it, it is for the first floor. Um, we have a, an accessible route into the first floor and we are developing a kind of video option for uh, the cellar, which is very interesting, and for the second floor where the bed chambers are. Um, the kitchen office, uh, the first floor is accessible as well. Okay. And I think I seem to have stabilized here. <laughs> Could you explain why the capital moved out of that impressive spot? Um, politics affects just about everything. And uh, some powerful people in the 18th century wanted to create a new capital and therefore Raleigh was laid out and built as the capital. I kind of wish they had stayed here. It's kind of impressive, but they wanted to move the um, state capital more to the center of what North Carolina was in the 18th century. Are there any traditional crafts performed or demonstrated at the palace? We do from time to time. Uh, what we've uh, been doing during the pandemic is um, an outdoor area where we've developed an encampment and we talk about the life of the soldier, cooking, and then we also extend it to other domestic activities. Uh, but in the past, we've done spinning and weaving and dyeing. Um, we this year have raised some sorghum and we're going to create sorghum molasses. And if you go into the uh, kitchen, uh, we do open hearth cooking and that's really uh, very engaging to people. Do you put Christmas trees up at the palace? Not in the palace. Um, we have two artificial ones in the history center, uh, but we do not um, put them in the palace. And the square footage uh, of Ooh. the... Boy, that's a good question that I'm not sure I know. Um, 20,000 square feet, maybe. It's it's a big old building. <laughs> uh, do you have? I need archives? to find that out. Do you have archives or information on the first hostesses of the palace? Uh, we have some. Um, we do have a fairly good collection of um, really just the records, the training of docents in the 1950s and 60s. And recently we were donated uh, uh, one of the hostess's original outfits, which is now part of our um, artifact collection. Uh, where did the palace's enslaved people live? We're not 100% sure. Uh, the difficulty in interpreting um, African-American free and enslaved uh, populations is there's not a lot of documentation. I think in the palace itself, um, a number of people would have slept on 
pallets in the bedrooms or adjacent to the bedrooms of the members of the family that they were in service to. Uh, there are, uh, is also a second floor in the kitchen that's kind of divided into a men's dormitory and a women's dormitory. Um, but the truth is we're not 100% sure. There's actually a third floor to the palace um, that is not open to the public. Um, and it's very likely that um, people use those rooms as well. How much has the show Outlander helped increase visits to Triumph House? And is there any truth to the governor's character from the show? Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, Diana Gabaldon, who wrote uh, the Outlander series, um, has visited Triumph Palace a number of times. Um, a few liberties, of course, are taken, but it's a reasonably uh, accurate portrayal of Governor Tryon. And yes, the series has brought a lot of interest. We actually do um, a specific Outlander tour once a month, and it usually sells out the minute the tickets go um, out for sale. We have a question about uh, general funding, I suppose. How does the, how does the palace keep running? <laughs> Where do we get our money? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> um, about half of our funding is from a state appropriation. The other half comes from the Triumph Palace Commission, Triumph Palace Foundation, um, or any grants that we might receive. We also do a lot of rentals and that provides income. So about 50% of our operating cost is in non-state money. We also have an incredible pool of volunteers. At one point pre-pandemic, it was close to a thousand volunteers. That doesn't mean we had a thousand people here at any one time, but um, people that would volunteer to do very specific uh, tours. So our overall operation is about a $5 million operation. Um, the funds for ticketing go into a special fund that is used to pay maintenance salaries and maintain the buildings. Did the brick wall and house survive? I'm assuming they mean the fire. A small portion of the foundation of the palace did survive and you can see that on tour. Uh, the, the kitchen office was completely lost. People tore it down to get the bricks and anything that they could salvage. Uh, the stable um, did survive, although it over its period of years before the restoration, a lot of work was done to it. Uh, we have a request to discuss the gardens at the palace. Oh, okay. We have 14 acres of gardens. Um, again, very much in the colonial revival style. Um, they're beautiful any time of the year, but I encourage people to come in the spring when the tulips are blooming. But my favorite garden is the kitchen garden directly behind the kitchen office um, where we raise a variety of crops and then use them in the kitchen for cooking demonstrations. The grounds are beautiful. Uh, what was the population size in 1760 and what was the main source of commerce? I don't know the population size, but it remember most cities in North Carolina at that time were very small. Even today, New Bern is only about 30,000 people. So I'm going to guess maybe in the five to 7,000 uh, range. And there were a variety of things going on. Um, uh, fishing, uh, timber harvesting, 
uh, crops raised on property outside of the city was kind of a mercantile center. So it was commerce, I guess, would be uh, the best word to describe it. Uh, there is a question about the crest above the entryway to the house, yep. and if it has any significance. It does. It is the crest of um, George the um, Third, and in French, it says, um, "My right by God," um, which underscores how the British monarchy felt that they were in position. Um, because of God's will. And the cellar, what is, what's in the What's in the cellar? Um, pretty interesting. That's where the um, head butler and the head um, household, I forgot her name, had uh, their, their quarters. But what's most interesting is that's where a lot of the um, rare and expensive things were stored, like wine and other adult beverages, but more particularly spices. Um, and so even the cook had to come over and get the spices from the cellar of the palace in order to, to uh, prepare meals. Do you have any American Sign Language interpreters? Uh, we don't, but with enough advance warning, we can um, uh, schedule someone. We do have a number of people on staff who do some signing, um, and whether or not that would be sufficient, I'm, I'm not positive. Uh, were there any trials held at the palace or was that set aside an area set aside for legal proceedings maybe not that i'm aware of it was you know think of it more as the legislative and executive branch and judicial would have been um, handled in the courthouse and i guess this will have to be our last question are there any burials at the palace are there any burials? Was that the question? Uh, no, there are no burials um, on the palace grounds. Um, and most of the palace grounds were heavily disturbed in the uh, period when after the palace burned up through the 20th century. So. Uh, no, that was not a burial place. All right. I think that's all the time we have for the questions. Thank you, everyone. Those were great, great and challenging questions. We have a lot of engaged visitors and attendees. <laughs> um, thank you, Bill, so much for this wonderful virtual trip to Tryon Palace and a beautiful way to kick off the holiday season. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. I'm very happy to have been asked to do this. And uh, if any of the people listening in come to Candlelight or come to tour, please identify yourself. I'd like to thank you personally for, for coming down. Thank you. And thank you to all those of us or all those of you who joined us this evening. Um, we hope to see you at our next History and Highballs celebrating a Victorian Christmas with Corners Folly. That's happening Thursday, December 9th uh, this year at 7 p.m. via Zoom. We hope that all of you had a wonderful evening and we will see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you.